And that COPA-90 report into the mindset of young fans that Owen mentioned is one of the discussion points at the Soccer X convention. It looks at what motivates supporters from China as well as Brazil, the UK and the US. And Owen spoke to James Kirkham from COPA-90 and asked him what surprised him most about the findings. Perhaps one of the most interesting, one of the most surprising was over 60% of young modern fans would be quite happy to pay for just a small section of a live game, like the last 20 minutes, for example, at a reduced rate. I think it's particularly interesting where everyone's sort of scrapping over rights, where rights are hugely valuable for so many, and that's often enough. Now, I'm not saying that's great. I think it's a continued threat, actually, to the 90-minute product. I read your report and thought, if I was a marketing executive at a, at a football club, I'm not sure whether <laughs> I'd panic or rejoice at this kind of diversification. And you're essentially talking about football clubs now having to compete for attention because fans are plugged into just so many leagues and clubs and, indeed, national teams around the world. Absolutely. The, the global nature as well can't be underestimated. Fans as young as my son are nine or ten years old, remember, have been entirely influenced by gaming, for example. They play the popular franchise FIFA, EA Sports, his game, the likes of Football Manager. It gives them this sort of encyclopedic knowledge of the game that we simply didn't have when I was their age, sort of 30 years on. What it means is that they are just as interested in MLS in La Liga in Spain, they are far less tribal and sort of parochial. They'll be diving into the Bundesliga and telling you about the third choice right back at Athletic Bilbao with the same level of fervor as kind of winning an FA Cup. The point is, it's never been more sort of competitive, if you describe it as such, uh, in the way that clubs or club owners or people marketing in those sort of departments have to consider what they, is they're doing and how they're getting out to young fans. I'm almost tempted to grab my phone and, and find out, as you were talking, James, who is the third choice right back for Athletic Bilbao. But I guess that's the point, <laughs> capturing this attention. Uh, you're one of the few organisations... Well, my ten-year-old will tell you. <laughs> no doubt. That's the, that's the, ridic that's the ridiculous thing. You're, you're one of the few organisations um, to have done any serious research about Chinese fans as well. I found that fascinating. You have looking at their viewing habits, their consumption habits. I think there was a stat that's about two-thirds of uh, young, modern Chinese football fans, uh, for example. You know, they are happily uh, in, intending to buy products from a football club, from an official sponsor from a football club, so they've got that affinity. And yet, over 30% of them, they have their greatest affinity with players. In other words, they'll get their access point via Mbappe or Messi or whatever the... Jaden Sancho, whatever the kind of star of the day is. That's their sort of start point and way in. So I think they average about 25,000 uh, fans per game now in the Chinese Super League. That's comparable to the Championship in the UK. That's, that's ahead of kind of a lot of European leagues. So this is a, it's a pretty serious state of affairs. You did mo yeah. most of your research, I think, before the Women's World Cup. What did you make yeah. of the impact of that tournament in what it's doing for modern fans and how they're thinking about the game? There's an interesting almost trajectory that's sort of been going on from then. You know, it starts really with an inequality, uh, certainly a seeming one very unfairly kind of literally paid or supported versus, say, a men's game. That leads through to this idea of empowerment. Everyone brands latched on before the World Cup talking about empowerment. And, and I think that normalising aspect uh, came through in the World Cup. I don't think we finished, but we're definitely on the way there. You know, England have got a game here in Wembley and they're looking to sell it out. And they're like, they're pretty much likely to do so. So to sell out an 80,000 strong stadium in a country like England, having so recently moved from two or 3,000, you know, playing at kind of slightly more B-list kind of club grounds, there's a brilliant acceleration going on. And, how, and um, How long do you think that, normal that normalisation would, would, would take? in the women's game? We assume this is a long play. When money is there, uh, that money works through the game, as we know, through leagues, into players, and so on and so forth, getting to grassroots. So it's a, it is a vital cog. So you've got brands like Visa, who, uh, for example, are fascinating in that they're properly committed. It's not like, hey, we're coming in for a World Cup and then we go again. This is an eight, nine, ten-year commitment.